Hey everybody, this is uh, Tony Miracker and I'm your uh, section chair for the Toronto section. Um, tonight we have uh, uh, our March meeting for our section and it is on standards update for the media industry. We've got some great papers that um, we are going to entertain and educate you with. Um, we are good on as far as uh, our sponsor is our TTC, which is going to happen in 2023. Uh, we've decided not to have one this year because there is that kind of COVID. Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? We decided to take a pass. So hopefully everybody is uh, okay with that. But next year will be another year. Um, so tonight's meeting has been arranged by Lee Whitcomb. Ilya Dorian and Savine Aldamedo. Um, and um, Savine will be the moderator for tonight. Um, Ilya will look after the questions and um, we'll, you'll hear this a couple of times tonight. We're doing questions after each presentation. Uh, and um, put your questions in the Q&A tab of the Zoom uh, interface. And so you now I'm going to let you take it over from here. You can steal the presentation from me and um, take it away. Welcome. Uh, we have our four presenters here today for a lovely night. Uh, I hope all enjoy the uh, presentation on the standards. We are going to have uh, three parts for the presentation. The first part will be for the SEMPTE standards with Thomas, Mason, and Lee. The second one will be with Felix uh, about uh, the AWMA. And the third, third part with John, and he's going to give us the latest on the VSF. So uh, let's start with Thomas Mason. Thomas is the director of standards development at the SEMPT, where he leads the SEMPT standards development efforts and industry engagement. He began his career in Cologne, Germany, as a computer programmer for automation software in the nuclear and automobile industries. Before his move to Los Angeles, Bowles Mason worked at the West German Television and Cologne Broadcast Center, where he led the quality control department. In addition, he worked as an independent database developer. In Los Angeles, he became a post-production consultant, build and run the encode operations for Ascent Media. Joining NBC in 2005, he focused on an emerging digital media technology, expanding two years in London to support the company's international business. Then moving to New York in 2008, Mason worked and NBC, NBCU advanced technology team, providing technology directions, proof of concept, product, product evaluation, and best practice implementation advice to NBCU's various business units. He assisted industrial organizations in the development of standards, technical recommendations, and stood group, group reports. He holds several patents related to watermarking, 3D, authentication, metadata tagging, and VR. Welcome, Thomas. So hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm here today to give you uh, uh, the SIMTI update from a, a SIMTI home, home office uh, perspective, uh, more high level, right? Uh, not so much diving into specific uh, standards efforts, uh, but more general directions of SIMTI. Um, and the PowerPoint I created is called SIMTI Square Transition. And I, I will explain in a moment why. Um, let's start with this curve. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, curves like this. Uh, over the past uh, couple of th uh, a few thousand years, we had several tr uh, technology transitions, um, which over time uh, went faster and faster and faster, and uh, complexity increased. Um, we're about here. Um, Simply was founded here, and um, uh, the internet started here. Um, let me show you another uh, curve, which is very similar. Um, and uh, this shows you transitions in society. I put some key uh, metrics down there, organization, economy, and 
uh, communication. And as you can see, um, uh, these uh, transitions are increasing in speed as well. Um, uh, the world becomes more and more complex. Uh, that's that's a, a given. Um, we are now in the planetary phase, uh, which is also called the Great Transition, somewhere there at the beginning. Um, so we are just moving into this uh, area of global governance, globalization, and uh, global internet. Um, the point I'm trying to make here, we can't just look at the uh, technology in isolation. We also have to look at what's happening in society and uh, what are the needs in the society. At the same time, uh, uh, the, the, the transitions and the new technologies are driving the transitions in society and vice versa. So there, there, is, a, there is a connection. Um, uh, we have decisions to make uh, if we're going through these transitions. So we're here. Uh, the future is uh, somewhere over there. And on this way uh, to the future, we make decisions and these decisions form uh, uh, the future we will experience. Uh, so if you look into the news, uh, you could get the impression at the moment, everything is moving towards the apocalypse um, and uh, the end is near and uh, we are heading towards a breakdown of society. I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, on the polar opposite, uh, you have utopia. Um, I don't think that we're gonna get there either. Uh, but if you look at what uh, decisions uh, governments making today on what's happening in society, uh, I would think that we um, move to a sustainable global society, uh, which works for all of us. Uh, so it's not a given. Um, it really depends on our decisions, the decisions we make, and obviously the events which uh, put doubt on that, like Ukraine, for example, uh, is, is obviously uh, not a good development. But um, over time, uh, we still have some time left in this transition. Uh, we may get to this uh, global society and leave those uh, uh, problems behind. Uh, so what I mean, we have some challenges here, right? Um, uh, that really says we, we have to build this sustainable future uh, for us. Um, we have to work uh, towards a global egalitarian society, which works for all of us. Um, deal with an increasingly complex world. Um, uh, we know that. Um, and uh, respond to the acceleration of development. Uh, these are really, I think, uh, opportunities uh, and challenges for uh, Simpy as well, right? Um, so growing demand for sustainable te te technology. Uh, Simpy has to do something there. Um, I, I, we're not uh, uh, done enough right now. Uh, need for global, diverse, and open society. Uh, we are to, to a large degree global. Um, and uh, but we have can improve there as well. Diversity, we have uh, some efforts to um, uh, uh, increase diversity, and then we need to work to this open society. Um, dealing with increasingly complex technology, I think Simpy is a, is a master there. Um, we're doing this for over 100 years, uh, looking at technology and trying to simplify and, and uh, make it interoperable. Uh, and then respond to the more agile uh, technology development cycles. We have done stuff there too. And uh, simply the simply standards process has become better. And we introduced, introduced um, uh, new, new um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, efforts in that way. So we can want to talk about these in a moment. Um, let's start with sustainable solutions. Uh, this is something uh, from an, um, a paper I found from Ernst and Young why there are growing calls for global sustainability standards. And this really tells us you know, that um, uh, investors are more and more looking at companies and accessing them on uh, how they react to um, uh, environmental and social and governance factors. Um, and they also measure them uh, if they adequately consider environmental and social risks. Uh, so what does that mean for Simpy? Indirectly, uh, directly maybe not, not too much, but indirectly, um, the companies uh, who, who are concerned about this and who are concerned about investor money, they, they even so they partner with uh, Simpty today. Uh, maybe they don't partner with Simpty in the future if we don't uh, also meet these um, environmental and social risk um, and, and these environmental and social governance factors. Uh, so that's certainly something we have to be aware of and work on. Um, so what we're doing in Simpty uh, currently on sustainability solution uh, I have to say not much. Um, it's, uh, we had a, uh, a few sessions at the ATC uh, 2021 uh, um, where we talked about sustainable solutions, but I think Simpy has to do better here and, and um, uh, look at this top topic more closely. Um, what can we do? Uh, you can look at what partner organizations did, the DPP, for example. Uh, they developed their DPP Committed to Sustainability pro Program. 
Um, uh, so you go to the DP, DPP site, you can find out more about that. EBU, um, they uh, uh, reaffirmed the commitment to, to make the um, broadcast industry greener um, and to consider their environmental performance. Uh, uh, there's some impact there. Um, but as a standards person, I, I'm interested, you know, what can I do in the standards development? Uh, ISO published a guide here, um, a guide 82 uh, uh, from in 2019, they did that, uh, Guidelines for Addressing Sustainability in Standards. It's a, it's a guide for a standards developer uh, to look and how to make uh, standards more sustainable. Uh, so that's something I, I personally, uh, you know, interested in and looking at. Uh, the, the URL down there is not to the document. The document, unfortunately, is for sale at the um, ISO store. Um, and if you're interested, it's not for free. Um, but there are also, there's also a link um, uh, to um, ISO other sustainability projects, if you're interested. Uh, so more to do here, right? Uh, global society, um, this is a, 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 a map uh, of the world with data centers from Azure and uh, uh, Amazon, I believe. Uh, I don't know how old it is, maybe maybe outdated, but the point really is they're all over the world. It enables this worldwide IT infrastructure. Um, and we are already uh, uh, dealing with some of the benefits of that, uh, content delivery, uh, business to business and business to consumer across the globe, Netflix, right? Uh, distributed uh, production using cloud services. Um, if you have been at HBA, not this last one, but the one before, uh, you, you may have seen the Lost Lederhosen, which was a on-site production uh, in the cloud using cloud technology um, to produce a short video. Uh, really interesting and I thought uh, really educational. Uh, so that's there. It may not be in full bloom, but uh, it, it comes. Um, and then, you know, SD2110 IP, uh, media over IP, using commercial IT products is a, is a goal, right? Um, to take advantage of that economy of scale and then moving towards software, more software. I personally experienced that in standards development, more and more of that, the stuff we're doing um, it comes with um, software. And uh, so that becomes stronger and stronger. And we may, may have to reject, um, uh, react to uh, some of the open source solutions as well, uh, important for SIMT. Um, and then the emergence of sharing uh, economy. I found that very interesting. Um, that's uh, Uber, Etsy, Airbnb, you name it. Um, and there's efforts to do similar things in uh, media and entertainment uh, for production. So interesting times. and. Uh, the point here, making SIMPTI is already global. We are, we are, we are. If you look at the card, we, we have SIMPTI chapters all over the world, and uh, similar. If you compare it to that uh, data center map, uh, very similar. Um, we have we are engaged with international standards bodies, um, uh, ISO, ITU, IEC, for example. Uh, we are ANSI accredited. We deal with EBU and so on, um, and then we have uh, member companies from all over the world. Um, and, but at the core, our, our Simpty uh, people, um, the, the people who are actively involved in uh, uh, making Simpty come alive, um, they're all over the world, um, which, is, which is a great experience um, uh, to work with them. Um, so Simpty is really global and, and um, we, are, we are there. Complexity, I said, we are, we are already a master in that. Um, uh, we, 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 we look at uh, issues in the industry, new technology, customer needs, proprietary solutions, process requirements um, and, and more. Uh, this is just a, a short list. Um, and we can take these and bring them into, into SMT, uh, investigate them, harmonize them and form consensus as a, a neutral trusted partner. Uh, but again, all this uh, does not happen without our members um, and their expertise. So they're really at the core and with them, SMT comes alive. Out of that comes interoperable solutions um, but not only those, uh, we also do courses, events, and journals, as you know, and to educate on these solutions. So I think we are, we are well positioned um, as, as, as a uh, you know, master uh, of uh, taking on complexity. But we're doing more, um, uh, maybe uh, more newer efforts. Um, uh, I created this upside down pyramid. Uh, on top, we have the Simply Strategic Initiatives uh, that is really looking across multiple um, technology areas in a very broad way um, and look at what's needed, what can simply work on, uh, what technology areas should we focus on, right? Um, underneath that is uh, something new. We, we just created rapid industry solutions. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. That is more looking, again, broadly 
but more on one technology, uh, one specific technology. And underneath that lays the what we call the standards community layers. Uh, that's the study group, task force, right? And then uh, public CDs, RDDs, standards, uh, and and there are obviously other um, engineering documents we can put up here. But the 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 idea here is really to say that as as we start on top with a very broad view and then narrow it down to a very specific uh, technology solution we address in standards. And while we go through this. Um, from, from top to bottom, uh, uh, time effort increases, process increases uh, for good reason, right? Um, and, um, but we're gonna start out in a, in a, with a broad base to suck new people in um, and get them familiar with what Simti is doing and then um, you know, uh, get them maybe uh, also involved in standards development. It's more like a funnel, really. Um, Let's look at these strategic initiatives as, as I talked about. Uh, there are three at the moment we're looking at, uh, Media in the Cloud, Pro AV, Esports, they all worked on, but arguably uh, the most important one is Media in the Cloud um, uh, for Simpy and the industry. Uh, so there's an advisory group now, uh, actually for a while now, for I would say half a year, year. Uh, and it's a think tank of uh, um, Simpy and partners uh, to identify barriers for the transition into the cloud for media and entertainment and then uh, suggest um, uh, you know, what we can work on standards, education, uh, whatnot. So that's happening uh, in, and uh, they already started um, uh, something new, new effort, which probably will be announced at NAB. Uh, it's a super user group for media and the cloud, um, a community for users and vendors to come together and discuss uh, and learn from each other, um, exchange best practices uh, in a moderated forum, uh, really give them a discussion forum. And uh, out of that, we hope uh, uh, come needs, we can then address in these other layers uh, further down. Uh, the next layer down is, uh, oh, if you want to get involved, Joe Welch is your man. Um, uh, email him. Uh, he can get you together with the right people uh, for the Media in the Cloud initiative, and uh, you can get involved um, and uh, maybe worth your while. Simply rapid industry solutions is a new thing we're trying to, to do um, to give uh, people uh, easy access to Simpty. Um, you know, we talked about the open society, easy access to Simpty um, and um, uh, maybe solutions which are faster than standards, right? Um, so we, we started with a very narrow uh, um, a, a, a project, uh, but uh, with a broader view of this topic. And that's uh, the topic is onset virtual production. Um, it's again a, a non-commercial neutral uh, space where people can come together, identify and solve challenges and uh, we want to provide an immediate information sharing and then outputs, um, uh, output deliveries in uh, 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 less than 12 months. Uh, so these are not standards, uh, you know, the standards organization still exists. This is kind of purposely out of the standards box um, to, to uh, uh, be more uh, accelerated and more rapid in uh, what we're doing. There are three work streams. Uh, there's an educational one, outreach, interop. The educational one is uh, uh, looking at creating courses and webinars. Outreach is where can this group get involved in what events. And then uh, interop is looking at technical issues. Uh, we identified two so far file formats and camera metadata. Uh, there's a metadata, camera metadata uh, subgroup now. Uh, and they're looking at uh, creating um, uh, solutions for camera metadata. Output is to be determined. Um, and then uh, because this is a new effort, we need to figure out how this funnels into the standards um, uh, organization. Um, if you want to get involved, again, uh, there's an email here. Uh, Carrie Gruben is the project lead. There's an email too on the Simply website. You can find more about um, risks and what it is about. Uh, you can scan the QR code as well if you like. Um, let's talk about the next layer. Oh, uh, this is uh, actually one of the first outputs uh, which came out of the risk group. It's a wall chart. It's an ecosystem for onset virtual production, and it's based on this movie lab visual language. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's um, uh, a way of a, a, a flow chart language um, uh, movie labs created. Uh, there are two links here, uh, one for the visual language, and then the other one is for the flow chart if you're interested to learn more about it. The next layer down is a task force. Uh, I picked out uh, uh, the mo more interesting one. I think we have uh, three task force at the moment. Uh, this is probably the most interesting one, a task force on AI. 
It's a joint task force between SIMTI and the Entertainment Technology Center. Um, and they are looking at the topic of uh, artificial intelligence and media. Uh, the ETC uh, conducted some round tables. Uh, I think they're still going on. They do them in like a month or two months rhythm. Uh, it's interesting to join them. If you're an ETC member or a SIMTI member, you can, you can be part of that. Uh, outcomes of that go into the group. Uh, the group also conducted a survey uh, to see what the industry needs are. And they're working on a report um, which will look at the classes of IA technology for media. Uh, the results of the survey will be in there. Uh, what's out there in standardization at the moment and what new stuff do we need to look at? Uh, but they also look at media related data sets. Um, if you're familiar with AI, AI needs training. They need these training sets and they want to look and see what's out there, which is important for media and also look at is there a need to create new ones. So a really interesting uh, topic. Uh, if you're a SIMTI member, I should have put a link on there. Uh, but if you're a SIMTI SC member, uh, you can just join the task force. It's on our new uh, collaboration platform, the SKN, um, and you can uh, join through that. I wanted to talk about uh, another layer. Uh, that's the public committee draft. It's, it's a new effort we put in place uh, to accelerate uh, getting results out to the standards industry, uh, to the media industry. Uh, you may be familiar with that. Uh, I'm putting it here because uh, a lot of people haven't heard about it. So um, usually you have the due process SIMTI um, uh, is using to create the documentation. Once a drafting group is done with a document, they give it to the technology committee. It becomes a working draft. Uh, there's going to be a, a two week review. Comments get resolved and it's a committee draft. Uh, then we go into an FCD ballot. Um, after the FCD ballot comes, uh, uh, comment resolution, then we have a pre-DP vote review, then we have uh, DP vote, then we have an SD audit, and um, then we go to simply publishing. And at the end, uh, you have finally have a public product, which you can buy from the IEEE store uh, or IEEE uh, digital library. It's not a store. Um, and um, uh, then it's public, but this can take months to, to go through. Um, and we wanted to do something quicker. So what we did, the first part is still the same, working draft, review committee draft, but then you can go to the standards vice president and say, I want to make this public. Um, up to three years, uh, you can make it public. That gives uh, a direct access to everybody, not only simply members, but the whole industry. Um, they, they, they can review it. Uh, they can start implementing uh, the document. Uh, and by implementing, there's going to be um, comments uh, coming out of that, maybe a suggestion for improvements and so on. And then once this public review is done, you can continue, pick up where you left off and continue your process. Uh, so you saved uh, a lot of time. Uh, we calculated ideal case. Uh, you can get uh, a public CD out from a, from a working draft as soon as it becomes working draft within five weeks. Uh, so that's uh, you know the faster it can go. But five weeks compared to months or years, I think that's a, a, a vast improvement. Um, once it's out there, uh, you can revise this thing, um, you know, as much as you want. Uh, once you think it's stable enough, uh, you can continue just where you picked up and go through the uh, process. And uh, at the end, you have this published standard. Um, I think it's a vast improvement in speed of what we're doing. How do we do this? Um, uh, we, we use GitHub for this. Uh, so simply had a, as a GitHub account. Um, on there, we have different things. Uh, for one, there's access to the public CDs. Um, you have to become a GitHub member. Uh, it's free. You can just join. Um, and then you can get to the SIMPI account. Um, I have the URL down there on the bottom of the slide. And then you can uh, access these repositories. If you're familiar with GitHub, GitHub repositories have an issue tracker. Uh, you can go in there and lock your uh, comments, your concerns, and whatnot. And then it will be considered and worked into the new um, revision of the document of the public CD. What else do we do there? Uh, once a SIMTI document is published, uh, we have one in five year reviews that after a year of publication, we look at the document, determine if it needs to be revised. After five years, we look at the document, determine if it needs to be revised. And in the meantime, uh, at least for some, we started for some documents. You can come, come here uh, to GitHub, uh, their repositories for the published documents. And again, you can lock your issues there. And then once we get to the revision of the document, you can pick it up from there um, and, and work it into the revision of the document. Um, again, it gives you a, a, a place to go uh, in the meantime uh, till we get to the revision uh, to lock your concerns. 
Um, we developed software, I mentioned that. Um, there's some reference in conformance software we did uh, that's on here uh, as well. If you want to get into the private groups, you have to be a SIMT uh, uh, SC member. You have to pay for standards participation. And then you can ask the TC, uh, the governing TC for the repository to add you to the, to the group. Uh, what else is on there? Miscellaneous document and some software um, um, uh, we, we use for other tools, let's say. Free standards. Um, I'm, I hope I still have a bit of time. Um, Free standards, uh, that's a discussion which is going on for a while. We're finally getting to a point where we uh, have an earnest effort uh, to look at this and um, uh, to make them free. Why would we do it? Uh, there's just a new generation of professionals um, who do not like paywalls. Um, I have a software development background. I don't like paywalls. Uh, I'm a big fan of IETF and W3C. Um, uh, it's a great system of HTML documents, which I can just go through, they're, uh, inter, in, they're interconnected, uh, cross-referenced, um, it's great. And uh, we should look at um, uh, uh, how we can do that in Simply as well. Uh, and that's just what this effort is about. Um, uh, so, so it really will also uh, broaden the reach of Simply standards. Uh, because in the past, you dealt with large uh, hardware design teams uh, uh, that changed to, to in a way, uh, while, when, while we moved to more software development, um, we, have, um, we have now smaller teams. Uh, sometimes it's just a guy in a garage who's developing a product. And um, we want, want to make these simply documents available, available to them so that they consider uh, implementing them. And for those people, even if it's $150, it's, it's, um, uh, they, they just have a uh, a barrier there, and then obviously there are the the, the uh, free software people. For them, it's a it's a uh, ethical thing, right? Um, so I think we we can we can cater to those people. And the problem, so is we have to rethink how how we uh, do our business, right? How uh, think about a new simply standards business model, uh, because all the sales and um, uh, subscription um, they they are helping to support the organization. They pay my salary. Um, I want to continue working, right? Uh, so we, are, we don't want to give that up. Um, we need to understand how we can get uh, revenue from other sources. Uh, and maybe uh, the free standards uh, help with increased membership, for example, right? Attract more people to join Simply and, and work with Simply. Uh, so it's an ongoing discussion. We need to uh, figure out how we're going to do this. Uh, we may start with a, a, a small set um, of standards, which we make available for free. Um, so stay tuned. There's more to come. And one good news uh, about this effort, um, we started uh, doing uh, what is called next generation standards uh, in SIMPTE, um, where we have these landing pages for a family of standards. Uh, so this one is online. Um, it's uh, the URL is down there. Um, it's for IMF. Um, it's uh, all the IMF document and uh, documents which are related to IMF. Um, so uh, they're gonna be on this page. I cut this up into two parts because the page was too long. I think it's 69 documents for this effort. Uh, we, are, we are in process of making free. Um, but you have on this page also other information uh, like links to other groups uh, who are working on IMF. Uh, and then there's open source uh, tools you can get to. And then uh, we wanna put videos on there, uh, you know, understanding IMF, for example, and so on. Uh, so this is kind of a POC where we're trying to make um, uh, simply documents for free, see what the reaction of the industry is, uh, how successful this will be, and then uh, uh, work on making more documents for free if we can. Um, but again, uh, it all depends on what the outcome of this POC is. Um, I end with this slide again, you know, it's really uh, up to us to make the right decisions. Um, uh, you, you're not uh, getting to the future you want if you don't get involved. Uh, so get involved is a kind of a call to action. Um, you're already simply members, so I, I, I guess I, I, I preach to the choir, but um, uh, it's, it's important to be uh, a part of this. And as you can see, we are working on things which really uh, facilitate this great transition of Simti and into the sustainable global society, uh, which works for all of us. That's it. Uh, thank you. Thomas, thank you for your great uh, presentation about the SEMPTE initiatives. Uh, great to see you have a lot of new way of thinking coming. Uh, next presenter is Lee.
um, from Image and Communications. Lee Whitcomb is an architect for Image and Communications in Toronto, Canada, having joined the company in 1991. He participates in SEMPT, uh, Alliance for IP Media Solutions, IEEE, and V. SF standard committee, committees, including serving as the co-chair of SAMP32 Network Facilities Architecture Technology Committee. He is actively involved in SAMP ST 101010, professional media over managed IP networks, and SAMP ST 2059, Genlock over IP. He became a Septon Fellow in 2017. His other professional affiliations include Professional Engineers Ontario. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the University of Waterloo, Ontario, in Canada, and a master's degree in electrical and computer engineer from the University of Ontario in Canada. He is the co-inventor of several patents in the areas of networking, timing, and synchronization. So, so where Thomas sort of gave a very high level view of, of SIMPTE, I'm now going to sort of do a bit deeper dive into some of the actual standards and, and I'm not going to cover all the work that SIMPTE is doing, but I'm going to sort of highlight a few things that's going on in SIMPTE. Um, one thing, so, so, so Thomas mentioned sort of the process that standards go through, but one thing he sort of didn't cover was how do, how do we even start the process? So kind of the process to create a new standard is someone comes up with a project proposal and that can be sort of pretty much anyone can come up with this. And there's basically, you're looking to say, I have a problem to be solved and I think it should be a standard or a recommended practice. So this is kind of what kicks off this. From that then, there, I mean, Simply's working on a lot, of, a lot of different things. And so we've organized into these various technology committees or TCs. And so there's, what is it, about eight of them or so. Um, so one of them, so standards that are related to sort of essence, so things like video compression, things like that would go into 10E things that are related to IP networking and SDI, things like have basically plugs on them, go into the network facilities, the 32NF, that's the one I'm most involved with. Those ones for control and IMF. So we're sort of structured into different, um, these different technology committees. And then each of these technology committees are sort of furtherly subdivided. So like in 32NF, we're working on a fair number of standards. And so we're divided into working groups, some dealing with sort of timing and synchronization, another working group deals with sort of video or the essence over IP standards. Um, there's another working group dealing with sort of SDI, which is not the most active now. So this is kind of how, how SIMPTE is structured. Now, because there's sort of so much work going on, it's hard to sort of know what's going on. And so what we have is plenary meetings. So every uh, every three months, every quarter, we have a, a set of plenary meetings where each of the, the various subgroups and drafting groups sort of report up. Um, so we have these sort of meetings here. And then from that, we also generate a public or a, an outcome report. So where I'm just going to touch on a few of the standards, if you're curious about what are other standards in their status and, and, the, and the different projects that Simpy's working on, you can go to that, the link I have at the top. And so you'll see our last set of uh, plenary meetings was back at the end of February, March, and then sort of going back three months in December and then August and June. So um, all the different reports are available. So if you're sort of curious on the status of any reports, you can you can go there. If you prefer more of a webinar format, um, Simply also does some webinars on effectively the status reports. So if you go to that, the link there, you uh, at the bottom, you can see a presentation that will sort of, it's about an hour and a half, so it covers a lot of material, but it'll go through each of the different technology committees and sort of what's happening and some some highlights that are going on, describe some of the projects. So if you're if you're interested in, in the SIMPTE standards and their status, there's sort of these links that you can always follow. Um, so Thomas had mentioned about the, uh, the public committee draft process. Um, so if you're interested more about standards that are available right now, um, if you follow that link there, you can, which we'll do in a second, you sort of see that. The one other thing just to also note here, what, when it's in this PCD state, um, the documents are available. We encourage people to come and look at them. You want to see, does it meet your needs? If you're a user, if you're an implementer, you can take a look at it, see if it makes sense, because we do want to sort of get these uh, standards to make more sense. Um, the other thing too is people need to be aware of it. 
So we do have on the SIMTI website, you can go there. You'll also see various webinars and all kind of like road shows that SIMTI will be doing to help encourage this. We also sort of reach out to liaisons to various groups to say, hey, we think you might be interested in this. Do you guys wanna take a look at that? So that sort of goes on. So if you're curious about sort of like the ones that are currently in this phase here. So if we sort of scroll down, we've got a couple pages of, of different things that are in this PCD process. They also have sort of a start and end. So here, so one's on this extent or the TLX, the new time label, it's, it's process started on January 1st and it's gonna run for six months. So depending on the standard and how much input we need, um, say six months might be sort of common. Now, one of the to watch out for is, I mean, after that period has ended, then they're no longer available. So there's just that sort of a certain window that you can then contribute before it goes back into, into the into the SMPTE process. So if we were to look at, say here, the uh, the TLX one, so we click on that. So what, what you'll see is there's a, for each of the ones that are in this PCD process, there's a, a description about the, the project. So there'll be a, a description here. There'll be the links to the document. So I can sort of just click on the link to the document and it has the, uh, basically the, the, the draft version of the standard here. So it's, it's, uh, it's the full standard. So you can download it, read it, interpret it, try to implement it, provide comments. And then as Thomas was mentioning, this is done in GitHub here. So if you have, you can sort of add comments and, and provide feedback. So ideally, if you find an issue, if something's not clear, you think it should be changed, you can provide comments, which is kind of the, the purpose here of the, and then there's also sort of uh, contributors here. Okay, so let's uh, that. Okay, so now sort of digging into some of the standards. So we'll start here looking at the 32 and F standards. Now, I, I think these are sort of some of the more interesting standards that Simpy's is working on. Now, the fact that I'm the co-chair of the 32 and F technology committee, I'm totally and completely unbiased. So these are just really cool standards and it's not because I'm the technology chair. Um, so looking at, so we'll sort of cover a little bit what's happened with the 2110, which is the essence over IP standards. Uh, there's this new kind of document called PICS. We'll touch on that. A little bit what's happening about PTP, the, the TLX. And there's a, a group here on the inter-entity trust boundary. So within the SIMPTE process, uh, sort of Thomas had touched on a bit where we go through a one-year review. So after the standards have been out in the field for a year, people have now, more people have had a chance to implement them. Sometimes people find issues, they find things aren't as clear. And so we go through a process where we decide like, does it need, a, does it need an update? Yes, no. Uh, for most of the 2110 standards, we decided that yes, they, they needed an update. So we've gone through a process where we've got feedback from the various implementers. We've sort of looked at things that weren't clear that could be improved. And so we've gone through that process now with pretty much all the 2110 documents and they are very, very close to being published. So I uh, don't want to sort of say when, but they're in kind of that, that, final, that final stage. So hopefully, reasonably shortly, you, if you do check on the, uh, the SIMTI website, you'll see um, new versions of, of all these standards. Um, for the most part, there's nothing too, too radical. So from current implementations and stuff, there's not a lot of sort of compatibility issues. It's, it's, they're all sort of, even though it did take a while, but there's nothing sort of too radical there. So a new kind of document that's, that's new to SIMPTE, and it's relatively new to this to our industry, um, although it's not new to other industries, it's something that we've sort of taken up from other industries, is something called a PICS. So PICS stands for Protocol Implementation Conformance Statement, or PICS. And what this is, is a structured document to, to allow you to sort of assert what specific requirements are met by given implement, implementation. Um, AS67 or the AS or AS67 in their 2018 version was kind of the first in the in the broadcast industry to have this this pick. So they added an appendix to the end of AS67, which was the picks for the AES, and that's kind of what SIMPTE is is modeling our, our picks around. So it's it's not totally brand new to the broadcast industry, but it's probably most people don't know about it. So I'm just going to dive into a little bit more, just so you kind of get a bit of better sense. So what are the benefits of PICS? So for an implementer, someone's designing products, um, it provides a checklist so you can make sure that you have sort of 
implemented everything in the standard. And it also, in some cases, provides a bit of extra clarification. Sometimes the standard is maybe not as clear as it could be. Um, it can be a little bit extra clarification in the fix. Many of you are probably like end users. Um, it helps you by sort of, you can sort of confirm what, what requirements are met by a particular product. And sometimes in the standard, there are optional components to the standard. So you also have very, it's very clear then when you're looking at a, 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 some equipment, what was implemented and what wasn't. And by going through this, this sort of PICS documents, it helps improve the interoperability. It doesn't guarantee interoperability, but it helps in terms of the interoperability that people have implemented the standard in the same way, which is a, a, one of the, the main reasons why we have standards is we want to have interoperability. For your, for your procurement department, um, for your users, um, it allows you to maybe, you can include or ask for picks as part of the, the, their tender process, or if there's certain features within a standard that are optional that you want to make sure that are included, it gives you a way to sort of comment on that and track that. So it can help in your, in your tender process. When it comes to testing, uh, the picks can be used as kind of the basis of, of test plans and for things like the JTM tested program, which we've sort of talked about in the past, in the next version of the JTM tested, it'll be based on the uh, all the PICS documents. One other thing I didn't cover on the slides is that one of the things we also found was doing the PICS, you have to read through the standards very, very carefully. And as you're doing that, we uncovered things that maybe weren't as clear in the standards. So we actually fed back from the PICS drafting group, group back into the uh, the, the group that was doing the 2110 standards to say, hey, this section wasn't as clear, or what did you really mean here? So it, it also provides an extra sort of check to make the standards even better, which was nice that the standards were in the sort of the one-year one year review process. So we, we decided in, in, within standard, simply there's various documents. We're using something called a recommended practice. And we've decided to make it a separate document. So unlike AS67, which made it an appendix, for sort of maintenance and updating purposes, we decided to make them separate documents. The problem being is that because Simply has all these kind of like kind of random numbers for standards, it can be hard to find things. So what we're going to do is that the the PICS document is going to have a 100 higher part or the 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 part number will be 100 higher than the base standard, so they're easy to track down. So the the PICS for for the ST 2110-10 document will be an RP, so it's RP. 2110 and then it's 110. So we, we took the 10, added 100, got 110. So the picks for dash 20 will be 120. So it'll be easy to sort of track once you sort of know the little rule. So within the, the picks, there's very sort of these levels. Um, so in the standard, we use words like shall, which is, uh, an implementation must do. So we've sort of color coded those in the red. In, in the standards, there's language that says something should do something, which is sort of strongly su suggested, but it's not an absolute requirement. So we've made this a level two or a yellow. A standard may allow something that's permissible, or we're using the language around may, or it may have just text that requires no testing. So we've sort of color coded this to make it easier for users if you're when you're reading through a PIX to, to see if it's serious or, or not serious. So when, when you're sort of filling out a PIX, you'll see that there's a section which identifies this is the name of the product and the version number and some sort of basic identification. And then you get into sort of the, the core part of the PIX. So what the PIX has is for each, each part of the standard, there'll be sort of the, the called the feature, which is kind of the, the language from the standard. There's kind of a tracking number, oops, tracking number. What the requirements level is, so red is a shall. And then really what you want to look at here is the supported column. So what you want to ideally see is lots of yeses. Now, as an implementer, I need to know how, when do I fill it in yes or no. And so this note field here has a description to say, under what condition can I mark this as supported? So here, for this, for this wording of the standard, basically, I mark it as supported if my device supports IPv6. And then for this next one here, I mark supported if, I, if it supports IPv6 sorry, IPv4 for the first one, IPv6 for the second one. Now, from a standards point of view, because the second one's just a should, it's just in yellow. So if someone says no to this, it's not as concerning as, it, as if it was a red. Also, as you're going through things, some things may only apply to certain kinds of devices. So some may only apply to senders, some may only apply to receivers. So in the picks, there'll be some conditional stuff to say like, does this device contain a sender? And if the answer is yes, then this next question applies. And if it's a no, then this next 
question applies. So depending on if if what sort of if you're a sender or transmitter or various combinations, there'll be some sort of conditional parts. So when you put it all together, then as an implementer, I go through, I basically read through the notes to say, I, I mark it as yes, if all these things apply, I mark yes, 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 no, no, no. As a user, when you look at this, you can kind of see if it's a red level area and you see a no, that's kind of a concerning, you might want to talk to that vendor or maybe reject that product. If it's something like a yellow and I say no, you may not be as concerned. But you can very much see then sort of also what optional things. So you can see like it's optional for devices to support IPv6. And so you can very clearly see, oh, this device does not support IPv6, which may or may not be of a concern to you. So in your procurement, you may want to flag, oh yeah, devices must support section 612 or so on. Okay, so that's basically PIC. So this is something that's new that's coming. Um, we're getting very close to the PCD process. So if you're curious to see what, what this document looks like, sort of in the next coming weeks, months, or whatever, uh, hopefully we'll get that into the, the PCD process. Uh, some of the other standards that Simpty is working on here um, around the area around PTV device monitoring. So one problem that was identified was if, if I want to have a sort of a centralized monitoring system, so PTP is a rather critical part of my infrastructure, I want to be able to monitor all the devices to make sure that my entire, my timing infrastructure is good. But unfortunately, one device would implement a parameter called locked, and another device would implement a parameter called not locked, and another de device would, would implement no controls giving any indication of lock. And this made it very difficult to make sort of centralized monitoring nodes and, and sensing the health of your network. And so this was identified as a problem. And so uh, a project was created, which is the 2059-15. Um, and what it's doing is coming up with sort of a standardized model um, um, parameters and enumeration. So it's basically saying it's sort of recommended, it's an RP, so it's recommended that a device should have a parameter which indicates the lock status and the encoding is in a certain way. And to describe this in a very um, precise way, there's a, something called this uh, the Yang data model. Um, which is covered in RFC 8575. And so we're using this Yang data model to define all the different sort of parameters, the enumeration um, that, you, that you, a device should implement to be able to monitor a PTP parameters in a device. We're currently at that PCD process. So if you follow this link here, this will take, sorry, this link here, this will take you to the PCD version of the standard or the RP. Um, we actually are, are in the second round. We went through a first PCD process. We got some feedback. We did some edits, and we decided that it was enough things had changed that we actually want to go for a second round. And then once that closes, then we'll sort of finish off the standard. So the 2059, or the or which is based on the PTB standard, which officially is called IEEE 1588, um, it's been updated. So up until recent, or pretty much for the most part. All implementations are using the 2008 version or the v2, version two version of that standard. In 2019, although it actually came out in 2020, IEEE came out with a second version. Um, so they called it version 2.1. So it, it added some new capabilities. It, it um, clarified some things which were a little unclear in the standard. Um, so it's not a radical change, but it is a, it's, a, it's a new version. So you'll start to see now newer switches and devices there's not really a lot on the market yet, but they will start to be using this 2019 version or the 2.1 version. Um, one other thing that IEEE is currently working on, they haven't finished this yet, but they're looking at sort of the culturally insensitive terms like master and slave that are in the standard. Um, and they're coming up with alternative terms and will be updating the standard. So that is still work in progress with IEEE, um, but that is sort of coming. Now, one thing we sort of uncovered, even though that 2.1 was supposed to be basically backwards compatible with 2.0, as we look through it in detail, specifically around the SIMT profile, the 2059-2, we have uncovered that there are some, some minor issues. So nothing sort of too radical, but there does need to be sort of an update. So we have just sort of recently kicked off a new project to update 2059-2 to make it sort of in line and compliant with the 2.1 version um, and then also some, some things need a bit of migration or sort of specifying how, how things should behave to ensure sort of interoperability and compatibility. So that's a very new project, but it, it, it's moving quite quickly. 
Okay. And then the sort of the last thing on sort of PTP is that uh, Simpy is also working on look at security. Uh, security is becoming more and more important. Simpy for a while had sort of identified that PTP is a very critical infrastructure and securing it's important. So last year, uh, we came up with a study report or an engineering report, which was basically looking at uh, the, the various threats that you can have against PTP. So, I mean, there's lots of sort of general stuff, but this report is looking at what is kind of special about PTP. So that, that report came out last year, that's available. Um, it's a rather cryptic and odd link, and it's a little hard to find on the website, but uh, th that first report is out. We're working on a second report, um, and it's quite close. We had a, unfortunately, the chair of that group uh, changed jobs. And so that, that second report got delayed a little bit, but we now have a new chair. So that, that report is now chugging along again. So hopefully in the relatively near future, a second report will be out. And it's dealing a bit more with the mitigation. So the first report identified the threats, and the second report is sort of looking at ways to mitigate and manage those, um, uh, those, those threats. Um, just if, if this is a topic of interest, I'm actually presenting a paper uh, next month in May at the WSTS PTP conference in Denver, um, which is looking at PTP security. Okay. Another uh, set of standards which Simpty is working on are the TLX or the extensible time label standards. And don't ask me how we got TLX from extensible time label, but that's what we did. Um, and it's really basically the next generation of Simpty Timecode. So we've had Simpty Timecode now for like 50 years. It's worked really well, but it has certain limitations. There's things like frame rates, dealing with time greater than 12 hours. So it has kind of so, some, some limitations with more some more modern production, as well as there's certain features. Like we many years ago, we, we did a, an outreach. We went they had to Hollywood, the various meetings to look at what would, what would people want in a new time label. And there's things like, digital birth certificates and other features that they want, which just aren't available in, in 12M time code. So for a while, Simpy's now been working on this, this new TLX um, sort of next generation time code. And we've also now reached that PCD process point, or actually back in January we did. So there are three, three documents or three parts of the standard that are make up the, the initial set. Those are all available on, on, the, uh, on the GitHub there. So if you are interested in time code, um, I encourage you to, to go check out the, the, the standards that are there. They are until July 1st, you are able to sort of comment. So as a user, do, do these meet your requirements? As an implementer, does this make sense? So I encourage um, anyone to sort of go out, check out those, look through the standards, provide comments for that during that PCD process. Okay, and then the last, the last thing in the three two and F group here is the inter-entity trust boundary. So this is an example here where a company had identified a, a problem, which will, which is this, this trust boundary issue. So they they defined a, or there was a problem that needed to be solved. Um, they didn't want to have a proprietary solution. They wanted to have a, an industry solution, so that way it's better for them and better for the industry. So they kind of had a a, a draft of what they thought would be a good way to do this. But they wanted to take it to Simpty so that they could get more eyeballs on it, more people's comments, and come up with even a better a better solution. So that's what they did. So the so so the the problem, kind of in a simple way, is as I it's sort of a security issue, and as I have a sort of more a trust my more trusted part, then eventually I'm going to transition to a, an untrusted area, and so I have this trust boundary as I go from my trusted network to my un oops, my trusted network to my untrusted area, and then I have this demarcation point, and then I have various services and stuff I need to do at this boundary here. So this is recommended practice, uh, describes some recommended practices around that. So that said, they, they hear this one company sort of brought a, a, good, a, a draft of something which was then sort of improved and made into this RP2129. Um, it is also in that PCD phase right now. So if you're uh, if you're interested in trust boundaries and want to see what does the standard say, so you can start your implementations, or if you want to sort of contribute and find issues, um, I, I do encourage you to go uh, check out the, the the GitHub site. Okay, so sort of in the last section here, let's look at some other stuff that's going on simply here. 
So in, in two of the other technology committees, the media packaging and interchange or 35 PM, and there's the cinema surround sound 25 CSS or two other technology committees. And some work that they've, they work out. So in the 35 PM, there's the IMF. And in the cinema sound, they've been working on this immersive audio bitstream. Um, and then just one other thing that sort of ties into it is there's this audio definition model or ADM, which the, the EBU does, but it'll sort of all sort of come together. We'll hear and see in a slide. So again, with all the standards, we kind of, we identify what a problem is, then we want to come up with the standards to, to sort of solve that problem. So there's a problem here of doing audio delivery to the consumer. So as we're having increased complexity in audio, as we go from 5.1 to 7.2 to 22.2, and at most, we have sort of more complex audio. There's more services. We've got the main audio, commentary, descriptive audio, dubs, so lots of different audio channels to manage. We've got sort of better audio fidelity with sort of object-based and matrix stuff. There's the metadata that goes all with this. And then we look at various sort of standards here in terms of the delivery. You've got like um, Dolby Atmos and MPEG and stuff, and they all have different bit streams. And then when and you sort of want to make sure as we're combining these with our theatrical releases that we don't sort of have to keep redoing this stuff. So kind of what we have a, a problem here to be solved. And then sort of where Simply helps get involved here is because we have kind of the cinema world and the TV world are colliding. So we've got this, um, so within 35 PM, we have the IMF or the interoperable master format that, that's used there for, for mastering. Within the, 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 the CCS, sorry, CC, yeah, S, um, they've basically come up with the immersive audio bitstream. And then within uh, uh, the EBU, they have this audio definition model or ADM, and it's sort of a standardized metadata model for describing the technical properties of the audio. And then one other thing that's sort of going on right now in 35 PM is trying to bring this all, both the ABM, sorry, I, I, A, B, and the ADM together into the IMF world, sort of combining that. And this is going to then assist with creating global content for cinema, streaming, cable, sort of help sort of bring all the stuff together. And that's sort of what's happening right now in, in 35 PM. Um, if you're interested more in getting some, some resources and seeing some tutorials and stuff and getting into the details here, um, oh, here on the slide here, I've got a bunch of links on, on sort of the standards that would be of interest and various sort of educational and, and tutorial information on that. Um, so I said, I've just touched on a, a couple of the different standards that SIMPTE is doing, but hope we get a bit of a bit of a flavor there. I guess with that, we'll say, so if you have any questions on the stuff that Thomas presented or I presented, sort of anything on SIMPTE here, I guess we'll sort of see, are there any, any questions or did we make it so obvious that we have no questions? Okay, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions or I will read the questions from Q&A section. Any questions from attendees? Okay, a few comments from uh, Randy Conrad uh, on the free standards. The medical community could benefit from free standards for video and metadata and uh, AI as they modernize and move to fully digital systems. A parallel to television would be the viewer is the patient and the content is all of the patient's textual, graphical and moving video data from all the facilities disciplines within the medical community. And a few other comments from Randy, uh, security is paramount and medical community too and uh, audio standards could be included as free to the medical community as well. And now a question from, uh, unless Randy wants to add something to this, I will read next question from Martin Persaud. Uh, how will MFGs use the PICs? Yeah, so, um, so if, I mean, a few different ways you can be using it. So as you're doing, um, as you're doing your sort of tendering and, 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 process there, you can make reference to them and you can sort of quote if there's certain 
optional features of the standard you want, you can include those. Or when you're reviewing the proposals that come in and you're sort of going through to make sure, because I mean, kind of right now is that someone will say, oh yeah, I support 2110. And when you go through the details, they may not support everything in 2110. They might miss some optional features or they might have some more subtle mistakes and stuff. So say when you're doing the proposal, you can sort of, you can ask for, please submit the picks for your products that you're putting forward as your proposal. And then you can sort of go through them and make sure that, yeah. So anything which is the, the red required that they have no no's, or if there's any particular optional sections that you that are important for you, you can again, verify that they, they implement those. So it doesn't guarantee that they've implemented the standard co correctly, but it, it, it does make sure that they're making a, a statement of, we believe we implemented these particular parts of the standard. Thank you, Lee. Uh, no more questions? Let's okay. move on to the next presenter. All right, so our next presenter is Felix Poulin, uh, Director of Media Architecture and Lab at the CBC Radio Canada. So Felix is with the National Public Broadcaster CBC Radio Canada, where he leads the Media Over IP Architecture and Technology Lab, busy with finishing the new headquarters in Montreal, among many projects. Before that mandate, Felix was lead expert on live IP at the EBU. Felix completed his diploma in electrical engineering at Montreal's Polytechnic with his final thesis done at MIT. Felix is an active contributor to EBU, user chair of the Network Media Open Specifications and MOS, steering board of the AMWA and fellow of the SEMT. Welcome, Felix. Could you please share your screen? Thank you, uh, Savino, and, and, and thank you, everybody, for, um, for the invitation. Uh, it's a good opportunity, and I think we have a, a good package of, of updates, and I think that the presentation on NMOS is pretty much in line with what my colleague said previously in terms of the challenge of our industry to adapt uh, to a fast-changing landscape. Um, I want to cover uh, today um, the, the need for an open control plane to unlock media over IP adoption. Um, what is a MOS in a shell, in case you're, you're not aware? Um, secure control by design is very important. Uh, we'll see. Uh, creation of NMOS, the process uh, as well. Uh, and a couple of news, uh, recent news from, from the uh, recent workshop that took place and also what is cooking uh, as next for NMOS. So when we talk about uh, the need for an open uh, a control plane, when we look at uh, the literature uh, of coming from the user community, for example, with this uh, EBU pyramid, uh, we understand quickly that, uh, you know, 2110 and the transport layer is certainly uh, necessary and you can do a lot of things with it, but it's not sufficient when it's time to build a large scale facility. You need a number of things around the transport and the synchronization and timing. You need also operational control, uh, configuration, monitoring and security. Uh, so NMOS is addressing that operational control uh, in an open manner. Uh, we see also the color on this pyramid, uh, which dates from um, last update was in 2020, um, in July, I think 2020, uh, where the green shows the, the, the adoption of the technology, but the red shows that there still works to be done really to get a full maturity. The control is a bit, was halfway through uh, at this time. I think it pro progressed pretty well over the last year. Um, Another mention of the requirements uh, for control and for NMOS is in the uh, TR1001 from JTNM. Uh, it really is the reference in terms of building a professional facility, how what you need around 2110, and it covers ISO 4, uh, ISO 5, and ISO 9 that I will touch in a second uh, from NMOS. Uh, uh, along with 2110, 2022-7, 2059, the, the timing from based on PDP um, and, and a lot of uh, 
IT uh, also standards like DHCP, DNS, um, LLDP, and, and these kind of things. So it's very comprehensive and it's really a reference when it's time to build a, a large scale system. So what is NMOS? Uh, NMOS is a set of specification of APIs, application programming interface, uh, for managing device on professional media networks. Uh, the goal ultimately is the interoperability uh, to have a wide adoption of this uh, series suite of, of specification means that you, as, a, as an, an integrator, for example, you don't need to, um, uh, to deal with uh, very different pro proprietary protocols. We can have one that is covering uh, most common base of product. Um, and it's, it's used uh, RESTful APIs. So uh, get, put, patch, these kind of, of functionalities uh, that makes it very, um, very um, solid and um, easy to implement. So just to uh, go through the, the basic functionality of NMOS, NMOS is, is very well known for discovery, registration, and connection management. How does it work? Uh, you have a controller in the system that shows all the resources on your network that are available. The nodes. The nodes are the things at the bottom. It can be camera, display, recorders, switchers, all kind of uh, broadcast media gears. Uh, they are the media endpoints. Uh, of course, everything is connected to a net through a network, and there's a registry uh, that uh, that is the database of the, all the nodes that are on the network. So ISO four simply what it does it's um, allow the nodes to register themselves in the registry, and it allows also the controller to query this uh, this database. Uh, to be aware of what's in the network and what's their capabilities. Um, and that's it. And after that, once you, when your controller is aware of this, you can do a number of things on those uh, resources. Uh, the, the, the most obvious and, and important one is the connection, to establish a connection between senders and receivers. Uh, you can use ISO 5 to uh, have the controller tell a receiver to join the stream. So this is commonly adopted. There's a lot of, of devices, uh, more and more, that are using this from, from, the, from the, the ground. Uh, but NMOS is not just discovery, registration, connection management. It covers a lot of other functionality, uh, event and tally, audio channel mapping, uh, system resources, um, and um, a, a suite on security also with IS-10 and BCP-003. Uh, and, and it's not finished, it's still in development with new parts that I will show in a second. In terms of security, really, since it's using uh, RESTful, it's using HTTP, it was natural to be able to use HTTPS and um, to encrypt the communications uh, that are done. So it's not sufficient necessarily to, you know, protect the border of your network from the outside world. It's also very important to protect within your plan because most of the attack are known to be happening from inside. And so the control is the, is, the, is the one that you you don't want a third party to take control of your plan. So it's very important to be able to secure, securize this, uh, this control. So um, there's a suite of document starting with a, an implementation guide and then uh, the best common practice uh, suite uh, 003 uh, about the secure communication, the authorization process, and there's the IS-10, which is the, uh, the specification really to do the authorization uh, and their cert certificate provisioning also. So with, with this suite of, of, of specification and actually best common practice in most places, uh, that comes from the IT industry. Um, NMOS is uh, one of the few, if not the only one secure control protocol that is open. I'll talk a little bit about the creation of NMOS, how those specs come to life. 
it, it all started uh, ISO 4, ISO 5 in the AMWA incubator. So that was a creation of a, a very small group of di diverse vendors who would come together and experiment. And they will, uh, they will try, they will code, uh, they will discuss specification, they will draft a specification. And after a few months, they will show up in a workshop and try out their, um, the, the, the draft spec, how it works. And then from the learnings from that, they will go back to the board, uh, to the drawing board and, and finalize the work. And um, this is really a particularity of this uh, organization, the way it works. It's, it's really bottom up. It comes from ideas and contribution from users and by trial and error. Uh, to a level where when the idea has been tested a little bit, a uh, good number of, of vendors are agreeing, a good number of users also are interested by this, uh, it will become a, an, a, a proposal for a full-fledged activity that will draft a specification or a best common practice. So we have the NMOS steering that was created about two years ago uh, since this, there was a growth of the, the number of, uh, of, of activity uh, demands for uh, activity and specification, um, uh, we have this steering board, which I'm co-chairing, representing the user community, uh, with Randy Godwin from Magnica, uh, representing the vendor industry. Um, and uh, the goal of the steering is really to govern these activity to make sure that those proposal meet a certain number of criteria so they are it's it's promising that they will be adopted uh, the there's a good chance for wide adoption once we review this we will go to the board the board of director of the amwa which is a group of of um, elected uh, members of the amwa who uh, who make the the final decisions on the governance of the AMWA, and they uh, they will take the recommendation of the NMOS steering to start a new activity, and they will vote on it and approve it. So from this point, the activity is created, and we like those activity to be a short time bonded activity. Typically, it will be three months, four months. After what the group will come back with what they have as a result, and so this is very iterative. They will. Uh, they will have done, they will have shown some results. And sometimes they will say, okay, we need, we have additional things we want to do. Uh, and, and we will start a new iteration to complete what was done or uh, raise the number of functionalities, uh, improve uh, the specs. Um, and, and really every time you see an AMWA publication and an NMOS publication, it has been implemented because it has been tested in, in workshops um, and with multiple vendors. So the, the specification could be improved. Um, and it's also transparent uh, because it's published on GitHub. So everybody can see and can also interact with the development of those specs. Um, we all also have a number of mechanism around this. Um, we uh, just started an end user group and the need was how can we connect better with the user and understand what are their needs, their concerns, their limitations, their frustrations and ideas. And uh, really the goal of this group is to have this direct connection with the users and, and validate that what we're doing is in the right uh, spot to address their, their needs. Also, another aspect that we created recently with the growing numbers of, of spec, uh, we, we felt the need to, uh, to control the quality and the consistency of the specs we are producing against the overall NMOS architecture. So uh, we have this group, the small group of experts who, who knows the history of NMOS and who can review some of the work and can help to uh, make it consistent and, and provide uh, advices on this. Um, so 
at the end, what we want is specs that are being adopted. So we look for specs that are simple to use, uh, consistent, well-documented, uh, included in our test suites. Um, and with, with all of this, we believe that there's more adoption and we see, we see that it's happening now. So in the deck, it's the full story with uh, who's doing what uh, in the different organs of NMOS. Um, you'll see it's not a waterfall process. It's really a more organic than this, and that's on purpose. We really work hard to reduce the process. We talk a lot about the process, but when it's time to have to, to do it, we, we hope that it's quick and um, not cutting the, uh, the energy of the, of the group of the voluntary participants uh, that just want to basically develop the specs and implement them. Recently, we had a workshop. Uh, it was a virtual one uh, due to the, the conditions we are all know about. Um, it was covering nodes, so the endpoints. Uh, controller, which is a, a new dimension uh, where we spend more time with, with uh, implementing NMOS and controllers and registry testing. Uh, there was also a vulnerability scanning uh, run by the EBU uh, at, the, uh, at the same event. So the vendor had the opportunity to, uh, to test that. So those kinds of workshop, it's not like the JTNM tested, which is really a, a, a a place where vendor can come test their equipment and eventually get a badge to, to show that they have passed a number of tests. Here, it's really for the vendor to test their implementation against some, again, some testing tools, um, check about security scanning to, to see if there's any uh, vulnerabilities out there, um, and they can improve their product. Um, we got 70 participants from 30 organizations. So that's quite a good number um, of, of company who are uh, adopting and implementing NMOS. Um, and some company did not show up, but they are already are supporting NMOS. So they are more mature. Uh, so it's, it's even more than that in terms of who is actually doing it. Um, it was self-testing, so the test suite uh, was available, was explained how it works, some tutorial were prov provided, and there was a live assistance by the community on Slack and on Zoom to help, especially the newcomers to NMOS, to really uh, be able to, um, to progress. Uh, and you can see that as a practice for the next JTNM tested, where, of course, the result will 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 we know will be published. Um, and, and, and so uh, it was a good, good opportunity. We're, we don't have a fixed date for JTNM tested next. Uh, there's some discussion uh, at the moment where we hope to have something uh, around IBC. Um, and I'm I, I quite sure the vendors would, would like to see that happening after uh, these last two years. Uh, probably they've made a lot of progress with their product and, and we'll be happy to, to show that. Um, we ran a little uh, survey after the, the workshop, and interestingly, uh, we see the, who, the, the percentage of participants who did what. Uh, so no testing, 60%. That always been the, the primary uh, target of those workshops. Uh, registry testing, 30, 13%. Um, and about 27% of controller testing. That's very interesting number. Uh, since that's relatively new that we have uh, in, included those, those tests in our test tools. Um, security scanning, I was very surprised to see that's 47% tried it out. Uh, the intention at the beginning was lower. The company did say, yeah, if we have time and all, but finally uh, almost half of them have, have tried it out. Uh, so that's a good sign for uh, the maturity of security as well. Um, and another question from the survey was uh, about um, if the organization who participated in the AMWA workshop, if they ever participate in JTNM tested, and you see no was 47%. So 47% of the participants to the AMWA workshop never participate into a JTNM tested. But when we ask them, do you intend to participate in the next JTNM tested, 100% say yes uh, to some level. 
uh, JTNM tested only or um, uh, ST2110 only or including in MOS or both. Um, so that that's quite uh, and, and most of them want to test the whole the whole thing, including in MOS. So that's quite um, that's quite the good progress. So I, I, I took some slides from my colleague, uh, Rob Porter, Garrett, Sylvester Bradley, and, and Bradley and, and Jonathan Torp, uh, who will be presented at the presenting at the IP showcase at NAB on this topic. So there's a full presentation on uh, on the topic of, of testing NMOS, and that, that's very interesting. Those guys are really, uh, really good at it. So I really recommend to, to see that. Um, finally, I wanted to touch on uh, work in progress. So there's still a lot of uh, development upcoming in, uh, in NMOS. Uh, the major piece of cake, I would say, is modeling. Uh, that's a, a, a very important and strategic um, activity that will lead to uh, addressing uh, device control, status configuration of devices. Um, and there was a, a there, there was also a workshop within that group recently showing progress. Uh, so stay tuned because this will basically make NMOS a, a full control. A uh, plain um, protocol by including this part. Um, controller specification, there was a lot of work to clarify and complete in each of our spec, ISO 4, ISO 5, et cetera, uh, to make clear what it needs when you implement these in the controller. In the, in the original version of the specs, it was, it was not fully done. Uh, so we, we did a, a major effort to make clear what we need on the controller side of these specs. Uh, flow compatibility management also is an ongoing activity that will enable things like um, detecting the capability of, for example, a receiver like the, uh, the, the displays EDID table, which state, state all the different, um, the different um, format that the display can support can be transported. And before doing a connection, you can make sure that you, you have the, the right format to send to that receiving device. Um, so that's important, uh, for example, for the IPMX. So the, the pro AV version of using 2110 and NMOS, um, since uh, EDID is, uh, is really important in that segment, market segment. Also uh, ongoing work on stream mappings for other format than ST2110 on Compress. So the first one is JPEG XS uh, in 2022-2110-22. Uh, uh, um, and uh, also we're discussing about how to, uh, to also use NMOS together with H.264, H.265 uh, codecs and streams and NDI and CDI, uh, AWS CDI um and srt and other uh, format um and MOS could really become a, a one common way of doing um control plane including also we are doing a lot of, uh, of investigation on how to use NMOS in the cloud uh, so it's happening in the incubator um so again uh, this idea of having the same technology uh, being on-prem or in the cloud uh, looks very uh, promising. So we try to make it as easy as possible to use. There's a tons of resources. Uh, the specs are on GitHub. Uh, the, there's a, a number of open source code. I gave two examples from Sony and from uh, NVIDIA. Uh, to uh, to get started with 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 NMOS registry and and uh, easy NMOS is a suite you can deploy with a number of tools around it. Uh, testing tool um, it's also uh, out there. Video tutorials we have a number of them. Community support via Slack and on Amweda TV it's the the main entrance to all those resources. So that's what I had to talk about.
Thank you, Felix. Um, Ilya? Any, any questions to Felix? I don't have anything in, in the chat and Q&A chat. So maybe someone would like to ask a live question. Uh, okay. How is this, how is CBC using NMOS? So we use NMOS um, partially uh, in our new building, for example, uh, in Montreal. Um, we have to say that when we started the project in 2017, the adoption of NMOS was very limited. So we asked it, we asked for it in our tender. Uh, we, we really wanted to uh, use it as our main uh, way of doing things, but it was a bit early. So as the project uh, evolved and, and we started to implement uh, and, and build it, um, there was more and more product on the market using NMOS. So uh, we, we are using NMOS um, with, with some of the product for connection management, um and for also uh, managing the uh, multicast address uh I, I would wish that we have more coverage uh than this um if you would start a project today you could probably have a majority of nmos compared to uh proprietary protocols thank you very much felix is, it, is CBC only buying NMOS things going forward? Question mark. Essentially, we ask for it, um, and and that's that's becoming more and more a uh, a requirement, a strong requirement. Especially that we know that there's a wide adoption, and the the reason for not for not having it in a product um, uh, are becoming less and less important. Um, but you know, as a broadcast shop, um, uh, the user is uh, is uh, usually the one who asks for a certain certain model of equipment, uh, a certain functionality, and um, if the, the 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 only device that can provide that functionality doesn't support and must, it's very hard to to you know refuse installing it because it doesn't have and must. So it's not a 100% thing, but of course we work very hard with the vendors to get it working in NMOS because it, it facilitates our life uh, a lot when we can. I have no more questions, uh, Silvina. We are moving forward with uh, John Mayhot. John is the VSF director and CTO and director of product management at Imagine Communications. John has worked in the field of digital high definition television systems since its North American inception in 1990. He began as part of the AT&T Zenit team responsible for system architecture and integration of the digital spectrum compatible high definition television system prototype. And then served as technical lead for the Grand Alliance encoder at Lucent Technologies. He subsequently held engineering manager and general manager roles at Lucent Digital Video, Astra Digital Video, and the Harris Broadcast Video Networking Group. Today, Mehot is Chief Technology Officer of the Network and Infrastructure Team at Imagine Communications. He has dual bachelor degrees in computer science and electrical engineer from the Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology and has been recognized as a SEMPT fellow. Thank you, John. Let me pull up your presentation here. Give me. Hey, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, well, I'm gonna round out the evening talking about the uh, video services forum and uh, some updates on what's happening at the VSF. Next slide, please. So the VSF is working on a number of different technical specifications. Uh, we don't use the word standards because we're not a due process standards organization in the same sense as the SMPTE. The VSF is a trade association and it's an important distinction operationally in terms of how we conduct our business, how we conduct our rules, 
some of our IPR policies are different. But the goal is the same. The goal is to get like-minded industry professionals to agree on the technical approach to solving the problem. Because in the end, the whole industry benefits if we are competing on the technology of our thing, whether it's a camera, a switch, or a color process, or whatever. But the whole industry benefits if we have common technology for interconnecting systems. So customers can, in the end, choose the system they want to get the result they need. So all that said, the uh, I'm going to kill the camera because it's just too dark out here. It got dark as we sat. Um, we're working on these five big areas of work right now. RIST, which is about um, contribution systems using JPEG XS in a couple of flavors, how you might implement 2110, whether it's compressed or uncompressed over a wide area network for contributions. And then an entire area of enterprise multimedia called IPMX. So next slide, please. Talk about those one by one. Um, so RIST has been going on for a couple of years now in the BSF. It's chaired by Rick Ackerman from CBS. And the goal is to have an open public standard or open public spec really for delivery of pr principally RTP streams over the public internet. Now, there's a simple profile, a main profile, some annexes about levels to the main profile. Uh, recently, there's been an advanced profile, and soon there'll be some annexes about levels of uh, implementation of that advanced profile. Um, there have been interoperation events over the last couple of years. So, and the, the whole key of RIST is that it's a written down public document that says, this is how you do it. And there are actually implementations from different people that are written completely from scratch by different people that interoperate. And this is, you know, compares favorably against something like say SRT or Zixi where, you know, SRT, you get a DLL and you build it in, but you never really know what it does. Or Zixi, which is you buy it, you use it, but don't even ask what's inside. Um, so that's the goal of RIST is that it is a written down open standard that you really can read and implement on your own. Um, so that's RIST. Uh, let's go on. So TRO7 and the following one, TRO8, were written kind of in parallel to describe how do you use JPEG XS in a system. So there's a JPEG XS spec from the ITU, and there's SMPTE 2110-22 from SMPTE. But the goal of TRO7 and tier 08 was to document a contribution system that an end customer could point to and say, if I have two pieces of equipment that implement tier 07 or implement tier 08, then I know that I can have one at one end and one at the other end and have a reasonable expectation of interoperation. And that's across video, audio, timing, plane, ANTS data, so forth. So tier 07 defines a couple of capability sets because much like Lee talked about the PICs, you know, you need to spec these days. If you expect a product to do UHD, you better say so. But if you don't expect it to do UHD, you'll have different choices of what product. So it's important to have a nomenclature for saying what you expect. So we wrote down these defined capability sets to capture that idea of, you know, what do you expect it to do? Similarly, we wrote, you know, the spec has requirements and restrictions about, you know, the specific video profiles and levels and mappings and how the audio is done, how the ANTS data is done, how the program map table looks, you know, all that stuff that goes into making a transport stream. So this was published last August and there've actually been um, some bitstream exchange results. So we haven't flown everyone to the same place, but we've had, you know, everybody puts up a transport stream. And sort of eat each other's. Uh, moving on to tier 08. 
basically tier eight is the same story, but instead of it being transport stream, it's SMPTE 2110-22. And the cool John, you're muted. Oh, so sorry. Don't know how that happened. But anyway, sorry. The um, So tier 8 we again define capability sets and actually also conformance levels, where the conformance levels specify, um, you know, do you do HD, UHD, or UHD2, you know, good old 8K. Don't worry, it's coming soon. And then we had a couple of application profiles. So, you know, intra facility, intra facility, and then the last two, which relate to the IPMX work and, you know, sort of campus networks and so forth. Now, one thing to note about IPMX is that it really targets the computer's use case and the enterprise use case. And as a result of that, you see things like 444 profile and you know 1200 pixel vertical resolution. If you go buy a monitor from Costco, if it's a nice monitor, chances are it supports 1920 by 1200. And you know it might eat 1080, but it'll just put black bars up there. The goal of IPMX was actually that it should work properly. So that's what that last column of the you know sort of IPMX plus profile is really adding the formats that are not typically part of broadcast, but are very common in the enterprise. So again, TR08 was published um, back in August. We've also done PCAP exchanges and tried to play back each other's files and so forth. And based on that, we also discovered a few minor nits and there'll be a republication of that coming li literally any day now. The documents are done both for tier 07 and tier 08. And they're kind of in a publication queue that um, it's at this point, I, I really think it's just waiting for NAB. So that's tier 07 and tier 08 work of the VSF. That's gone well, it was quick. Everybody involved um, was all about making it happen. So the next thing going on in VSF is tier 09. Now, tier 09 covers the general set of problems around taking 2110, you know, video and audio data, all separate, separate streams, but taking them over a WAN so you could do contribution between relatively neutral parties. You know, today, if you're, say, you're carrying a hockey game and you're sending that back to the network who's the client of the truck, there's all these other takers who'd like to also get copies so they can do highlight reels and whatever. And that's all done as a matter of course every day in sort of the regular flow of business. We want to be able to do that in these new technical standards. So tier 09 was about how do we establish those kinds of links. Um, so the data plane, um, we've written down how we would trunk the signals together. So how do you kind of wrap the you know video and audio data parts maybe in a GRE tunnel but then at the far end, you can easily split that back out in the switch. Um, and of course, we define two different protection mechanisms, the traditional two path dash seven, but also dusting off one of the effect methods. And then um, some rules about how the essences are aligned. Um, the more interesting part of tier 09 is actually the control plane where we've opted to use the AMWA NMOS protocols but instead of having a big central registry in the sky where everybody's registered, we use it at the node level and then have kind of an out of band process for people to know about each other. So if I want you to be able to take my feed, I have to send you certificates and security information so that you can access my endpoints to request that feed. Um, and then we use ISO 5 again securely for the actual connection management of those flows. So this document again is in the final stages. We expect it to be published very soon. Um, the last big piece of work in BSF is TR10. And TR10 is, up. Oh, sorry, we'll talk about ground to cloud, cloud to ground first. I, my charts and I missed it. Um, so there's a third working group called the ground to cloud, cloud to cloud, cloud to ground working group. And I chair this one. So of course I forgot about it. Um, and it's really designed around the 
user requirements. How are people going to use these transports? What are, you know, we started with the challenge of how do we identify all the things we need to construct a link from the ground to the cloud, between instances within a cloud, and ultimately from the cloud back to the ground? And then we kind of surveyed, okay, what technical standards are required at each of those steps? How do we implement them? What groups are already working? So as we've done this, we found, okay, we've fed requirements into the AMWA. We've fed requirements into the other VSF working groups. So we provided user input and requirements that drove the creation of TRO8, TRO9, the control planes of TRO9. And some of the new activities in AMWA are actually driven by requirements that come from this ground to cloud, cloud to ground work, particularly the inclusion of things like AWS CDI in the requirements for the new um, you know, NMOS stream mappings group. So that's really the, the work of the GCCG group is in creating and defining the gaps and requirements to then drive the other activities that are deeply involved in that. So moving on to TR10, um, TR10 is really the true IPMX system. Now that group is building a whole system. So if you know Jack Douglas, or I suppose there's a chance Jean Lapierre is actually even on the line, maybe not, he's from Matrox. Um, there's a lot to do because the IPMX system really duplicates and extends the whole 2110 ecosystem that we've spent the last several years building, but in the enterprise space. And so for that enterprise space, there's a system document that's actually on the BSF site now. There's video and audio specs, which um, reference 2110 and then extend it slightly. Um, there's an ancillary da data spec as well, same idea. Um, HDCP is a necessary part of the HDMI world and well in progress. And then of course, you know, there is work going on on appropriate FEC for that kind of application, which might be just the FEC we've all done over the years, might be slightly different. And then there's work on network switch minimum requirements. Um, there's a spec on NMOS requirements. And one thing Felix noted during his talk, there's a lot of work on bits and pieces of IPMX going on in the AMWA. You know, how to do the EDID negotiation and extensions to NMOS to support this are going on in the AMWA working groups. And then of course, there's a similar to the JTNM TR1001, there's this TR109, which extends that envelope a little bit further for the IPMX case. Um, so that's kind of the whole world of IPMX and in a nutshell, the whole world of the VSF. And I will leave the floor for questions on those things. Okay, there is a question from Anthony Kuzup. Uh, John, you was cut out when he was talking about TR8. You started with a cool thing about TR8 and uh, cut out. The work on JPEG XX is huge. Could you please repeat your uh, speech on TR08 slide? Thank oh, you. okay. Sorry about that. So TR08 is exactly JPEG XS over 2110.22, but then really extended to be a system approach. So also describes how much audio to carry, how much ANTS data to carry, and then defines this nice table of levels and capability sets geared around different applications. So there's a, you know, inter-facility and an intra-facility application, and then also applications for the, um, the IPMX flavors in the enterprises where they reach. And some of the interesting things are in the IPMX columns where they add support for 444, 420, RGB, and so forth that we don't tend to see in broadcast, but are super important in the enterprise space. Thank you very much. Any more questions for John? Oh, uh, how is NMOS uh, IPMX deal with vertical video? I don't know. Uh, I currently in the 2110 broadcast world, like for multi-viewer portrait modes, we just rotate it, you know, pre-rotate it 
in the multi-viewer and put it out as though it was a rotated image because the little brick on the back of the monitor has no idea that the monitor is rotated. I don't know if the IPMX world is taking a more subtle approach to that. Here, if I'll jump in here, it's Tony. Um, Thank you. If, um, that's all for the questions. Um, then I would like to just to continue and, and, and thank all of our presenters, uh, Thomas, Lee, Felix, and, and, and John, and also thank the co-organizers, which is uh, Ilya and Lee, and also Savine, who did the Savino, Savino who did the um, the good introductions of everybody. So we thank you for that. Um, just grab the next slide. So there was a, there is a recording being made of of tonight's um, meeting. We will um, give the file to uh, Peter to uh, slice and dice and take out some of the extras because we do start this meeting early. So he chops it up and creates a nice presentation. So uh, you'll get an email from Zoom uh, over the next day or so with the link to that and, and give us a couple of uh, a week or so to get that all in order um, to get that all together for us. Uh, future meetings, um, May the 10th is going to be an NEB wrap up because uh, if I'm not mistaken, NEB is next week and um, I myself are not going, but uh, uh, during our board call this afternoon, there's a lot of people that are actually going. So uh, that's a good thing for the, the industry. Um, but what's also exciting, Ryerson has opened up its doors and um, they are going to allow face-to-face. -face. So um, we're going to be doing, and, and we'll send this all in an email blast to everybody. We're going to be doing a face-to-face -face and a virtual at the same time. And it'll be at the Ryerson uh, Eat Theater. So um, we're hoping this, uh, we have not done a virtual uh to zoom and also a face to face at the same time so uh we have our fingers crossed and uh, we're not afraid of the potential new technologies that we're going to be using so we're we're good with that um how come i'm getting an echo uh one two i'll 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 speak quickly. Um, June the 14th, we have a, um, um, we're not sure yet what we're gonna do. So from that perspective, we are uh, still scouting where we're gonna be going. We want this to be a year end barbecue event, but we will, uh, give you more information as that comes available. We got a couple of places that we are gonna go and hopefully we'll be able to um, do the, um, the barbecue and the meeting and have a tour as well of a facility. Uh, March's meeting, I just wanna give you some analytics of what happened in uh, the March meeting. We had 84 registered, 64 uh, came to the uh, event. 56 were from Canada and five were from the US. Um, we did do a poll because uh, we're, we're always interested in whether or not we're doing the right, um, the right uh, choice of topics per month. Uh, we always question ourselves whether we're repeating too often or are they still of interest? Are they still relevant? Um, out of the 27 people that did um, activate the, the poll portion of the meeting, 22 said we were current and uh, we are still interesting. So the topics are great. Four people said they were okay. One said uh, we need to uh, do a rethink. So uh, one person thinks that we're not on the mark. So we'll, we'll check that out. And one person took a pass and said, uh, I don't wanna answer the questions. So uh, the other thing too is uh, we are in election mode in, in the Toronto section. And I, I guess it's all across uh, uh, SIMT as a whole. Um, 
Sylvia and I are running for the second term of our two-year term. Um, but the section managers are uh, a new uh, selection of people. Jamie is returning. Um, Nathan Bentley is new. Matthew Bush is new. Uh, Randy Cardenrad is not new, but he has actually been up the ski slope and has come down. So he's been a manager. He has been a chairperson. He's even been a governor. So um, Randy is, um, um, I believe, Lee convinced him to, uh, to come back to the board. Uh, Ivan Real is uh, also uh, put his name in, and so has uh, Jason Ross. And so of the six, you're going to be selecting three, and and Sylvia and I. So the election is on. I believe it's till the. I'm going to think it's the middle of May, but I could be wrong. Could be near the end of April. But um, do check your email and and please do vote because um, you know this process requires uh, your involvement to uh, make sure that we make all the right decisions and and get uh, get some uh, feedback. Um, up to date information as always it's our website uh, if you want to get email blasts from us uh, you can become a friend if you aren't a member of simply that's the url to click on and it'll ask you a few questions in your email address uh, facebook twitter and email are those other uh, social uh, connections that you can get a hold of us and do you know what if we you do have any comments and you want us to uh, change or you think we're doing a good job or a bad job then just simply uh, toronto at outlook.com hit us up with an email and and we'll respond back to you uh, that's it um it's a be well and stay safe still because uh the situation of the uh, covid uh, is not uh, yet uh, gone away so it is running around and yeah take care and um that's a wrap so thanks very much. Bye.